Welcome, Joystick Justice League, to the 11th episode of Roundtable. I'm Mike Frusios. I'm Joe Morin. And today we're going to get into a hotly debated topic. I mean, this almost should have been like one of our fanboy uh, fight night episodes, but I think we, we both kind of have a similar opinion in this topic, Joe, so I, I, I feel this is kind of like a jumping ground for debate. We're going to talk about the dichotomy between open world and linear games, Joe. Mm-hmm. So, what's going on with this? Like, well, like, why are we talking about this? Well, we're talking about this because uh, it seems to be a, a trend in the, in the industry now. Where we're starting to see that, uh, like, these uh, developers are, you know, what I think it's stemming from is that a lot of these guys are seeing the, the, the success that uh, that uh, Rockstar's had with the uh, Grand Theft Auto franchise, and they're wanting to get the get that Grand Theft Auto money. Uh, that's probably the best way I can put it. Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, you know, Grand Theft Auto, it created a genre. I mean, it's it, at first when when sandboxes started coming out after Grand Theft Auto, you know, like the Getaway and all these like knockoffs, like what was it, True yeah. Crime, that just never and even in my opinion, Saints Row, which I think found its niche in the third or fourth iteration yep. by being kind of over the top and self parodic. I think that's how it set itself apart. But the first two really were just. GTA knockoff so I, I, it was fair to say that but we know now that the sandbox really is a genre that can be employed in many different uh, time periods environments uh, with different archetypes done well like we've we've seen it done in Far Cry 3 we've seen it done in Batman Arkham City you know yeah. there, there's quite a few other examples which we're gonna get into so I think we have to accept that it's, it's a beast that, that exists on many levels and that Grand Theft Auto probably still to this day is the best iteration of it, I'd say. But there's there are others that when there isn't a Grand Theft Auto to be playing, you can still go into another environment and enjoy that sense of freedom. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the sandbox formula definitely does work. You know, it, it, and it, it has a lot to do with what the, the, the game actually is. And that's what, what makes a good sandbox really great. You know, when you have, like, say, like Grand Theft Auto V, for example, you know, you, you, you do have your, your story and you do have your open world. But they they, they work together, and with the, the key to the to a really good sandbox game is that when you're when you're leaving leaving the story missions to go off and do other stuff, there's a nice wide variety of things to, to do. Like relevant things to do that that feel right within yeah. the day of the life of that character, and this is where. I, I think why GTA 5 is is such a f an awesome phenomenon that it, it just it touched so many people because um, GTA 4 and I, I guess we're kind of talking about awesome open world games right here. GTA 4 is one of the most contested Grand Theft Auto titles in the whole series. You know, I was a huge fan of it. I thought it was awesome. Nico Bellic is still one of my favorite, most complex characters in that series. Um, yep. It did have its flaws. You know, there were the, the relationships that were got that kind of annoying. Yeah. There was the reputation level, like the friendship level. Like if you if you denied a mission from Roman, your your friend level would go down, and that was annoying. Trying to play the story. GTA 5 finally balances all the things people hated about GTA 4 and now I think everybody can agree that that is still I mean Grand Theft Auto created the sandbox and it still rules yeah. over it. It, it sets it, it, the it, standard by which all other sandboxes need to adhere to. Yeah, because you know because you know they didn't just uh, rely on the same from that they have they they evolved, right? They, they they didn't just uh, you know keep cranking out uh, games that are very very similar to like the originals games in the series. They it, the series continued to evolve. And that's what made that good. And we and we saw you know and, and Rockstar seems to be the ones that really nailed us. And even with Red Dead, you know, it was another really good example that uh, you, there was a really good linear esque story to follow. But if you choose so, that there were there was a whole a whole wide variety of 
things that you could do on the side. I mean, you could you could literally turn on Red Dead Redemption. You say you have two hours to game that day. And you know what? I just feel like rustling some cattle today and going and do some hunting. And, and yep. you know what? That could be a, an enjoyable game session. Just go full on mm -hmm. rogue and stuff in, in the middle of, of this beautiful <clears throat> landscape with lots of stuff to do, lots of towns to visit, poker games mm -hmm. to do, like, like missions in other towns, just the way Skyrim works, okay. where everything just works to make you feel like it's a real life, okay? That, that's the key to a sandbox is that apart from sleep, you could almost imagine yourself substituting yourself in this character's shoes because you're literally living and breathing almost every day of this character's existence if you want to take it that far. If you don't want to just race you through the story, GTA 5 offers a wide array of things for you to do. Tennis, movies, mm. go to watch some TV, go tune your car, go on a Ferris wheel, go for a jog. Like it's ridiculous the stuff they keep pounding into this game through yeah. updates. And I think that's the key, it's just that that's why Rockstar is so huge is that they've always tried to reinvent themselves at every point. They never get comfortable. They're always trying to push that hardware. It's like, give me that PS4, let's see what we can do with it. And we're, we're gonna kinda get a preview for next gen and PC this fall. So I'm really excited about that. Yeah, that, I mean, uh, GTA 5, I mean, that, that's just gonna be awesome on, uh, on uh well, I can't call it next gen anymore. On the on the current gen and on the PC, it's going to be really uh, nice to see that that uh, that awesome game on, on uh, the, those systems now. Well, yeah, just with the uh, with and, and it's not only just a graphical upgrade, Joe. It's it's going to be like they're saying um, more traffic, better AI, greater draw yeah. distances, of course. But it just feels like it's just going to be that fully realized vision. It's kind of like what Last of Us felt like. It's like it was pushing the PS3 as hard as it can go. We're going to get into The Last of Us in the midst of this debate and how it relates to the debate between open world linear games because I think The Last yeah. of Us is a perfect example of, of, of a bridge between the two. But anyway, The Last of Us was pushing the PS3 technology so hard that at certain points I noticed where it gets a little grainy. Like you can tell they're kind of mm. down resing a bit to cram all that information in there and it looks great but it's a little grainy and now with the PS4 Remastered Edition it feels like we're going to finally see that director's cut that Naughty Dog really wanted to see when they envisioned this game so uh, excited about that but that's really graphics um, you know we're talking about great sandbox games Joe um, what are some other good ones other than GTA we, we mentioned a couple uh, another one one of the greatest is Minecraft I mean uh, that, 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 is, that is a sandbox but is is not uh, on story that that's just purely on creating and building, and it, and in a good example, I mean, it, there, there's a game that, that obviously wouldn't make any sense uh, being a linear game. That, that that's the kind of game that needs to be sandbox, and and again was done the proper way, and again is constantly evolving and growing. Right, and I mean, really, if you think about it, that is the core definition of what a sandbox is it's like i mean in gta it's all pre-rendered there's a city for you to explore but minecraft you go even deeper you, you actually build the city and and, and every and everybody explores and, and that's why it's a great example um i, I love yeah. i love i love batman um to an extent i, I would say it's a re like arkham city was a was a nice uh breath of fresh air but I don't think it needed to go that big that soon. And I think that, we'll get into that soon, I think that that game could have been something other than Sandbox, but still, I mean, in terms of when you look at all the Sandboxes, it works well, and here's the reason why. You're not doing anything uh, outside of the norm to really break up the flow of the gameplay. Kind of like a lot of the criticisms were with that Amazing Spider-Man 2 that recently came yeah. out for current and uh, last gen, where it just felt like there was a lot of loss of momentum. When, it, when I was watching like the Angry Joe review, it just felt like, oh, okay, it's like a goofy side mission or, or just something that just kind of takes you out of the suture. Whereas with Batman, it's like you have these concurrent storylines. You have the main storyline in Arkham City, you have the Catwoman sideline, and they all run concurrently, but it, it never feels like you have to be a slave to one or the other. It just kind of flows beautifully the way GTA kind of intersects all of its intertwining storylines. And I think that's the key to making yeah. a sandbox immersive. And, and, and with Batman, and another reason why that works is that when you just you look at the, the character and the uh, and, and the uh, the story with Batman. I mean, he has a, a wide 
variety in his, his rogue galleries of, uh, of, of enemies. You know, so take it makes it makes sense in the context of the, the subject matter for that to be open box. You have your main story that, that you know you're maybe your main villain or two that uh, the story is following, but then you have all of his other enemies to take on on, on the side. So in, in that respect, that, that that idea does work. Yeah, you know what? It, everything works towards enhancing the personality of the character. Because really, at, at the core of a sandbox, it's you being in the shoes of this protagonist. That really is the experience and how you grow along with this antagonist. Um, let's talk about the flip side then. Let's talk about a situation where that didn't work so well. Okay, so let's talk about something that you kind of inspired this podcast, Joe, and I can hear you kind of groaning already. Uh, yeah. No, I, I well, let's just get, let's just get right into it. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna mince any words here. Uh, Watch Dogs, okay? A, a game that uh, got recently and uh, was uh, you know it was tr- tremendously hyped. You know it was delayed, uh, you know for, for good reason, and, uh, and then finally came out. And uh, I and gotta say that uh, it's a good example of a game that suffers being sandbox. You know, it, it just uh, I mean I can list off a whole bunch of things. You know, the the character. You, you, you don't feel any attachment to, to the character in the story. You're, you're talking the, about the uh, protagonist, Aiden, right? Exactly. He, he's just he's not a character that you you get invested into emotionally and, and, and wanting to really kind of see what happens next. You know, and and just and getting to the the open sandbox part of it, just a lack of variety in what you can do. You can you, you can. Hack bystanders walking by, stumble across little uh, crimes going on, and th- th- that's about the, the extent of it. I mean, you can't just you know, there's just a, there's just a, a lack in variety of what you can do. Yeah, it just it just seems like a, a big empty playground with where a lot of the rides are, are closed for the day. It just doesn't seem like yeah. it seems like there's a lot of like useless space in Watch Dogs where there's really. I mean, obviously there's you can go walk the streets, you can learn about people's personalities. I didn't play it, but I watched you stream it quite a bit. So you, you can read the personalities of every citizen. You can you can yeah. uh, solve crimes on the fly and everything, but. Again, with with a sandbox, you mentioned this variety, Joe. What's what's the problem with the mission layout and the gameplay mechanics here, Joe? That you were mentioning to me. Because I was, I'll one... be honest, like I was kind of baffled when I was watching you complain about this game. But at this point, you'd been several hours into this. I just been watching this for the first time, so it seemed interesting to me. So why was why might I be wrong? <laughs> because what I've been doing. Was this the same as the mission I did before? In the same before, it's just that there's just no again variety. It's just very, very repetitive. So, so give me some examples of like repetitive stuff in Watch Dogs. Like, give me a few actual examples of what's repetitive. Well, the the most common thing you do in virtually every mission is, well, you you drive to to where you got to go, you hack the cameras to see what's going on, and then you solve whatever's going on. Babe, that, that, that's the main mission structure of basically every mission. Hacking cameras, seeing what's going on, get get the certain guy for the the hacking code that you need. Do the stupid ass hacking mini game that you have to do, which is a pain in the ass and, and gets very very old and repetitive again. It just it, it's it just it, it 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 feels like such a missed opportunity that if this game would have gone a little bit more on the linear open ended side, could have benefited. Does it, does it even have set pieces? Like I'm thinking something like in GTA 5 when you have to rescue Michael's son uh, from the top of the transport truck. Like that was a great sequence, right? Is there anything like that in Ubisoft? Like in Watch Dogs? Like cinematic Hollywood style? It's, uh, there are moments like that. There, 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 are, there are moments like that, but they're not really, they don't have that epic feel to it. It's just, it's not, uh, you know, it, it just again, again, it just suffering from, you know, when you go too open, just that it's a that this game is a perfect example of this of the of it affecting the experience in the story. When it's trying to do too much, it just it, it just lacks focus, pure and simple. Yeah, we've talked about this often. It's like you have there's a certain. Here's the thing, okay, for most of us 
were raised on movies and television. We're, we're used to something known as like the three act structure, which was derived from the Shakespearean arc, which has yeah. kind of like a rising, uh, you know, conflict and resolution and reaches like a peak in act three and where a big decision is made, the character changes from yeah. where they first were at the beginning of the story. We were used to that, and and, we're, and that's hard to do in in a game, especially in today's standard where gamers demand at least like an eight to ten hour campaign on average. Mm -hmm. You can't tell the same kind of story you would tell in a movie over an eight to ten hour span. It's a different arc. It's a totally different yeah. medium, and we are just on like the cusp of trying to figure it out. And I'd say that we've had already a few great examples in say like the last. 10 or 15 years where games have started to get more cinematic you know i can think obviously of uncharted which which keeps you enthralled you know last of yeah. us tomb raider the reboot you know really bioshock like one and three great games that just keep you enthralled but not on the traditional arc i think games now are kind of playing out like tv is going like where it's like a season you know, yeah. and that's what a, a modern story driven game feels like. It's like a season. It's like many different three acts stuffed into one game that has this big epic fucking finale. Like, you know, the, the warship at the end of Bioshock Infinite with the mechs and stuff. You know, it's just insanity. Or like the ending of Half Life 2. You know, that yeah. giant ridiculous battle. It's just like these epic, or the epic ending of Last of Us, which wasn't so big, but just intense as shit. Yeah, it was, it was intense and emotional. And it's and, hard and, to get it, that in a game like Watch Dogs, where it's just spread so thinly over this. Mm -hmm. It's like a thin. It's a very simple idea spread thinly over what 20, 30 hours to beat that game. Yeah, I'm guessing it's about that much. I'm still a little ways away from completing that game, if you want to call it that. And uh, you know, and I, and I gotta say, from what what I played through, it's it's one of those rare cases for me where it's I'm. Trying to find the motivation to actually go and complete this game, you know, it, uh, I'm getting completed just because I'm kind of a completionist when it comes to games. But it, it's it's feeling for me like like it's I'm not I'm not excited to to finish the story to see what, what what's going to happen. Well, you know what's you happening, know? Joe. I think a lot of what your argument is is that if, I, if I'm uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's you, you mentioned the flatness of the character. Aiden, what's uh, I can't I'm losing his last name because I haven't played it, but anyway, it, 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 it to me like from what you've been saying, it doesn't seem like he grows as a character. No. You don't really give a shit about his journey because he's not growing from scene to scene. Like you see with Grand Theft Auto, like with Nico getting you know stronger and stronger in every actor, or Trevor and Michael's relationship kind of going up and down through the story of GTA 5 as Franklin watches from the sidelines. That's thrilling, man. That's a fucking yes. great way of, of telling a story. But when you've got this flat character based on an archetype, Joe, we've talked about this so many times, this new archetype, the anti-hero, the cool, and like, that's... every man that doesn't talk and, like, he's like Gordon Freeman, but he's not as interesting. And, that, and that, that's the thing, too. Like, you, you just touched on it. You know, with the watchdogs, I, I, I think one of the issues too, when it comes to the story, is that he doesn't have another strong character to play off of. You know, in a, a perfect example, like a again. like a female in the infamous. That's not a great example. We'll get into that shortly. But Ellie and Last of Us. So that there's an example. You know, you you you, you just have one strong character, and, and that's it. You know, it, that there's that there were other strong in Last of Us had plenty of them. But in, in, in Watch Dogs, you just have the one character who's, in my opinion, fairly weak himself and just doesn't have any other strong uh, protagonists or other characters to play off with. Well, because, let's go back to The Last of Us, Joe. Joel and Ellie are yin and a yang to each other. They complete each mm -hmm. other, okay? That's why their bond is so strong, because they each have what the other one lacks, all right? And that's yeah. why they're so bonded. And that's why... You constantly question who the protagonist is as you play through that 16-hour game because you most people may oh I played through three quarters of the game as Joel but yeah but you were getting led around by Ellie so yeah. who was the protagonist there who was driving the story forward who were you doing this for and that's why again just this beautiful intermeshing of complementary characters Joe that that just fit the puzzle of each other that's why GTA 5 you've got and the perfect sequence right is in the middle of the game where you see. They're talking to the F FIB, and you see Michael, Trevor, and Franklin do the see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil signs, right? And you yeah. realize right there, it's like, man, these guys 
are were meant to be this trio. These guys, I, I haven't finished the game, but I know something major is gonna go down. Like the last mission yeah. is gonna be stupid. Okay, so yeah. I, these guys are just have such a tight chemistry, and that's what keeps you hooked. And, and not only that, not only their chemistry, Joe, but the fact that you GTA Five allowed you to switch between three characters in real time, man. Wow. So if you get bored yeah. of Playing as Franklin in, in, in the comp in, in like what Compton or whatever what it's called, you can go play as yeah. Trevor and cause some madness out yeah. in the sticks, man. There's just so much to keep you interested. And if you're sick of shooting, go watch a movie or or go yeah. on or go go to an apartment and watch the hilarious TV shows or just park off to the side of the road and listen to fucking Laszlo. You know, you know what? Uh, this is a, an upcoming game that, that I think is really gonna kind of break this mold. I'm hoping, and that's gonna be a. Uh, Metal Gear Solid 5 Phantom Pain, uh, the full-on game that's coming out uh, hopefully sooner than later. And uh, you know, the, the key with this is that, uh, you know, number one, you're, it's obviously the Metal Gear story for anybody who's played it knows that it's an epic story. You have a strong lead character in Snake and, and the surrounding cast. But this game is, yes, going to be telling a, a, a linear story and, and hopefully a very good one, but giving you enough openness to be able to tackle missions in different ways, but not going too big to become kind of confusing or becoming, a, like we've said, kind of spreading itself too much. It's not gonna be, you're not gonna be going off and doing a bunch of side stuff. You're just given a bigger world to... Coordinate you know, your attack. You, 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 have, you have 100 you, different yeah, ways now instead of 10 to get exactly. to your checkpoint. Right, yeah, it, it's, it's not gonna be on rails, but it's not gonna be too overwhelming it's not gonna be to like fallout on, right? 3 overwhelming where it's just a lot of nothing it's... for 15 minutes you know i'm sorry people exactly but fallout 3 yes it was a gorgeous game for its time but that game was for for the non-explorers for the story driven people like me and i'm not saying what i'm saying is right and should be the standard i'm just saying there are people who like a story and a plot that progresses forward and follow three oh my god all the walking but anyway um yeah you're yeah. right joe I, <laughs> I like what you're getting into here is is a way to kind of bridge the gap between open world linear because what we've been saying over and over joe i think our, our what, what our theme is here is that we are starting to see a whole bunch of games trying to go open world okay we see see this in need for speed we yeah. like games that weren't previously open world burnout i don't like yeah. open world burnout people thought burnout paradise was awesome i was the minority that thought it sucked i preferred like you burnout revenge yeah. man on the original xbox ps2 where it was just tracks all the graphical resources just devoted to those single tracks you're not wasting resources joe and that's what you're talking about with metal gear it's like you're you're using kojima is using his resources his finite amount of tech resources efficiently to make that fox engine look pretty but still give that sense game a sense of relevance and and depth beyond something that just feels on rails and that's hard to do that, that's uh, that's not uh, it's definitely not easy to do and, and uh, you know and he's always been kind of like a uh, kind of a pariah in the industry you know, he's always been kind of doing some edgy stuff and uh, I'm, I'm excited to see uh, him actually pull this off and, and I think it's the direction that, uh, that these type of games need to go I mean obviously there's there's some games that, that just need to be linear and some games like I said earlier with Minecraft that just need to be to be uh, open sandbox but for this kind of gray area in between, it's the way that, that, that it should go. Yeah, we're going to get back on that topic of, of resources. But I want to kind of yeah. build on what you were just saying about Metal Gear Solid. So you seem to be pretty confident about this. I mean, we all, all we've really seen are some cinematics and some quick time event sequences. We haven't really seen any of the third person gameplay yet, other than maybe that early concept trailer of the hospital. Um, but... Mm -hmm. If, if what we're led to believe is that Ground Zeroes is a is a kind of a peek in the door, did Ground yeah. Zeroes accomplish its open-ended linear style properly? Did it was it even though it was a short game? Forget the fact that it was a short game. Was yeah. it exciting? Did it flow? Yes, it did. It absolutely did. And uh, you know, I actually played through that game. Uh, I believe it was uh, I played through it more than a few times, and uh, I just found myself, you know. Playing it in different ways, uh, just not uh, going through the same path. You know, maybe 
I, I, I did one where I, I just kind of went all, all Rambo style, just shooting everybody. Or you know, I did one where I was just really trying to, to not have encounters with people and just sneaking and, and just getting to, to where I had to go. I, it was a very cool uh, way to play just to have that, that freedom. But to not be, like I said, overwhelmed and going, oh, geez, you know, am, am I going to be, you know, is this gonna, not going to work? Is this going to work? It's just, you, you, it worked well. Yes, it was short. It, it was a really good good peek, I think, of, of what actually that game is going to accomplish. It, it almost like seems from what you're saying, it's like at every, it's almost like you hit a fork in the road all the time, but it's not like a three or four way fork. It's like... A or B? Do I have to go this way or that way? And if I go this way, well, yeah. I can come back to this direction later. But it always kind of seems like it flows in the right direction. Exactly. So I think I think that's the, that's the thing, man. Like we, we look at other games that really toe this line beautifully. Okay, let's let's really talk about economization of resources because this is really where I want to like levy a criticism against Watch Dogs. Now let's forget what you just said about repetitiveness about a kind of a mm -hmm. boring, bland character. Let's talk about the initial criticisms of Watch Dogs, where, uh, I hate to get into it, but we have to mention this, was the frame rate and the resolution. Not hitting 1080p yep. on Xbox and st at a steady 30 frames, not 60 frames. <sighs> there were... Yeah. There were there were times where, where you know, some things would, would look uh, very cool, like... Like if you uh, like if it was raining outside, you could see little pools of water and, and stuff collecting on the street. But in general, overall, it really had I got I got to be honest, it, it had a seventh gen kind of a feel to it. It didn't feel like this good next generation game kind of really driving this genre. Yeah, and now honestly, I hate people are gonna hate me for saying this, but I kind of felt the same way about Infamous Second Son. Although yeah. to a great extent, be, it did have some nice lighting effects. I'll give it that much, you know, at least it gave it somewhat of a next-gen feel, but yeah, man, it just feels like sometimes, look at the flip side, look at something like, like God of War, or Drake, like Uncharted, yeah. games that feel massive, but aren't, like they're pretty much linear, but it's just like, it's just clever, it's clever level design to make, to weave you through that environment, to make you feel like it's open world, but it's not. Like Drake, at first you feel like it's open world, but eventually you realize there pretty much is a point A, point B, and you'll find it at some point, but it never feels like it's on rails. It always feels like what you're saying with Metal Gear, where you have some wiggle room to kind of negotiate your path through. That's the same thing with Tomb Raider, man. Tomb Raider, people have, art, people have mistakenly called that an open world game. It's not an open world game. It masquerades as an open world game through fucking brilliant level design yes uh, absolutely it's uh again you know it, it, it's it's interesting how, how that's pulled off you know and it just has to do with some of these clever genius level designers out there that that just mold that experience to basically to, to get to get the player to go where they they want you to but giving you still enough breathing room to, to be a little creative yourself. Yes, man. Ratchet and Clank did this too. It's the illusion of the depth, okay? So basically, the first, I remember the Ratchet and Clank games were brilliant for this in the sense that you had all these different kind of areas that were connected via like a shuttle trip that you wouldn't control, but it would guide you through this 3D rendered world, but it was a trick because underneath those globes and those cities, there was nothing there. There was nothing for you to go explore it's an economization of resources. Whereas when you put everything into a sandbox, you are sacrificing frame rate and graphics. And at this yeah, early point in the eighth gen, when people are aching for that PC experience, Watch Dogs just did not deliver. It, it, it did deliver. And uh, while we're touching this, uh, you know, what I think, what, 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 I, what I think that, uh, I think the two benchmark games are gonna be for us to really see what these new consoles are capable of or is going to be Phantom Pain, Metal Gear Solid 5, and Uncharted 4. I, it, it's once again, we're going to see from Naughty Dog. We're going to we're, we're we're going to see the true potential of the the PS4. We're, we're going to see. Okay, you know, is this is this system really capable of running at at, at, at 1080 and at 60 frames? And if, and if they can't pull it off, then. Geez. Uh, is, is, I don't think anybody's going to But let, let's even jump off from that. Okay, let's say yes. Okay, absolutely. I, th I think already Phantom Pain's going to hit 1080p, 60. You know, it, that's great because those are, like we said, 
restricted games in terms of where you can go. If they can pull that off, that's awesome. What I want to see now is if they can pull off the sandbox at 1080p 60. Yeah. Now, we're not going to see that in Batman because Batman's cinematic. If we can get to see that at 1080p, that's good enough for me. And I think Batman Arkham Knight is really going to be one of our first glimpses, along with the GTA 5 Remastered, into yeah. how sandboxes are going to perform on this new hardware. So I think with GTA 5, that again is going to be the benchmark. I think we're going to see what we were hoping to see in games like Watch Dogs and Infamous. Yeah. Well, we're, we're actually going to see that that awesome like PC level fidelity. Not quite the PC, like the PC version. I just saw an article today. It's supposed to be absolutely ridiculous but still it's, the ps4 one and xbox one versions are going to be awesome and i know arkham knight is is already looking sick so i, I feel it's confident gonna take some uh, it's going to take some real clever level design and, and programming to pull that off and, and i am excited to see what's going to you know it's going to take little tricks you know and maybe some new kind of little tricks and little moves are going to have to be created to kind of pull that off you know and, and you know touch on naughty dog again you know yeah, actually, you know, let's go back to Watch Dogs. You know, another big thing that, that I came across playing that, where the load, you know, we're supposed to see fairly low loading times with the PS4. The loading times in Watch Dog are, are are pretty brutal. You know, I, I spent my quite a bit of time sitting in those loading screens. Do something clever like what Naughty Dogs, mask your mask your loading screens with cinematics. That's a brilliant, it's a brilliant, brilliant move. You're actually speaking to my next point then. It's like I wanted to mention Far Cry 4. Tying into what you're saying, tying to what we were talking about before, how about, you know, like open world games kind of, like the, the open world games are going to kind of go out of the gate and really define the next generation. Also the yeah. trickery they're going to need to pull that off. And what you're talking about with the loading times in Watch Dogs, let's just really briefly talk about cloud computing. I know this is going to be a separate podcast, yeah. but to me, it seems like we're starting to see traces of what cloud computing is possible in terms of helping a game run on an extra level. I mean, look at what Far Cry 4, what's happening with that. You can download a standalone client if you don't own the game and temporarily play co-op in somebody else's Far Cry 4. Now, I don't know, I haven't done my research, I don't oh. know if that has anything to do with cloud computing, but it, it was never possible until cloud computing, so something's gotta yeah. connect there. I think we're gonna start seeing it, Joe. I think. They're going to start harnessing the power of that cloud to really bump these games up and make them work uh, properly on this on this massive scale they're supposed to. It's a it's a very interesting thing and, and can definitely help boost you know some of these games uh, experiences that we're talking about to have not not just all be relying locally with your hardware to, to really use you know, the cloud not only to, to save games and whatnot and, and kind of share kind of stuff but to actually use it to actually boost. The performance of the game that's what i want to see but in the meantime while we're stuck with the limitations of our hardware in the eighth generation yeah. we need to practice economization of resources again it, it's it's kind of like yeah. what sega did in the late the late fourth gen when they when they knew that they couldn't compete with super nintendo technically so they had to get creative mm. with their the existing toolbox and that's how we mm. got games like virtual fighter 2 gunstar heroes and vector man you know, yeah, th yeah. good things can happen with small ideas, and like it's going back again to cleverly designed semi semi open world games like Uncharted, God of War, Tomb Raider. Just kind of sometimes giving the illusion of depth is enough. If you if you have a compelling story and you have good level design and a good plot to kind of and, and a character to to engross you with, there's so many things that impact the sandbox other than just exploration. I think, Joe, that's the problem with, with the way people have been defining the pleasure of playing a sandbox game. Oh, it's all about exploration, doing whatever you want. That gets old after about 20 minutes. Like, honestly, I've never been one of those people that can just turn on GTA 5 and play chaos for three hours. I need something to happen. I'm just, I'm not saying I, I speak for everybody, but I yeah. think to, to get to GTA status, which all these sandbox are trying to do, they need to understand what makes GTA tick. Yes, we all get seduced by the idea of doing chaos, but at some point, there's something deeper there. Yeah, it's going out and causing just random chaos in Grand Theft Auto. I mean, I enjoy doing that too. But like you said, it reaches the point where Okay, you know, it's there's got to be a little bit more, and you know, when it, when, it, when it comes to games, you know, I, I'm definitely a person that, that uh, appreciates a, a game that has a, a good tight story, and I am a, a little biased when it comes to that. I, 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 I gotta be honest about that. Well, without it, 
whatever, how, okay, with Watch Dogs, however, or Infamous with your electric powers and the neon, however cool your abilities are, it, it, it inevitably becomes a gimmick if you don't have something deeper to, to, to prop it up. It's, it's, it's the same idea of what, like, what happened with Fuse. You know, I, I, I'm not really getting off topic, but kind of talking about the importance of this. When you rely on a game mechanic to basically drive your story, you're dead in the water. Like, and and, yeah. and people aren't stupid. Yeah, people may say, "Oh, I just want something mindless to play," but everybody likes a good story. And I think if if you are empty and hollow, like Watch Dogs seems to be, people aren't stupid. They're gonna see through it eventually. Even all the past, all the hype and the next gen graphics and, and the fact that you can download a mobile app and and do stuff like I, I think that stuff just like you saying if you do it enough it wears thin after a while you need something deeper and by relying on on our character archetypes and gimmicks that's what's going to yeah, kill yeah, the sandbox it, genre yeah you know another thing that that can really kill a sandbox this is i don't, I don't think this is getting on topic but i feel like i gotta mention this and when it comes to to uh to a sandbox i think where it can really suffer is if you have like these kind of set pieces that are going on Excuse me. That uh, you know, you got to make sure that that, uh, that this kind of stuff is happening, but it's happening in the view of the player. You don't want to have like something like where you're looking off in this direction and something else is big and epic happening over there that you can't even see. That harms the resources of your game. Yeah, exactly. It's just it's just wasted. That should just be part of the gameplay. It just it just shouldn't be like eye candy. And I mean, you know, God of War is kind of an exception. It kind of balances it. It show it's one of those rare combinations where it has massive action but eye candy in the background, and and that that's cool the way it designs that. So, Joe, I mean, yeah. anyway, despite what we're gonna say, it seems like sandbox is infiltrating the industry. People are, are are starting to say that the linear game might be dead. Do you think so, Joe? Like what? Like for, based on what we saw from E3, do you think that there's still a place for linear games, or do you think everything just needs to go open world? The, I think that there's a there's there's room for for everything. There, there's room for linear games. There's room for sandbox games, and there's room for the in between. We're, we're still going to see a lot of it. I, I just uh, one of my my main points that I want to stress here is I, I don't want to see too many just jump on this uh, sandbox band bandwagon to try and cash in on, on the success of other developers. You know, there, there, there's, you can, you can have a, a really awesome, like Valiant Hearts, for example, a, a, a linear game that can be completely awesome. Yes, and then you can have a GTA 5 that is a sandbox and can be awesome too. There, there, there's there's going to be room for everybody, but I just don't want to see everybody jump over to that sandbox side because there's there's certain types of games that just shouldn't go that way. Well, okay, so let's I we, we I, I just remembered something I want to talk about. Let's let's kind of get into why like we, we want to know like why is this happening in the industry? Like why do developers feel compelled to make everything open world now? And I think it has something to do with the fact that people are always crying about the prices of games. And it's it's usually the people who are, I'm yeah. sorry, I hate to be stereotypical, but it's usually the younger gamers who didn't grow up in the 80s and 90s who don't realize how cheap games are now in comparison to what you used to pay. I wish they had grown up in the NES era paying up to $120 for a copy of Tecmo Super Bowl. Like, ridiculous. Like, $110 for Mario 3 the day it launched. $90 for uh, Majora's Mask on N64. Like, game prices were ridiculous back then. Um, so here's the problem. $60 is apparently a lot of money to people. So now, develop for the last few years have had to justify themselves by yeah. adding value to the game all right so, and that's what I feel what's happening with a lot of these sandboxes it's like this inflated value they feel they have to add to it kind of like those games that we know a few of that we can mention now that they had a great campaign and they felt compelled to add a shitty multiplayer just to justify the $60 price tag to all the Twitter whores let's talk about that for a bit because I think that relates to what we're talking about Oh, for sure. Uh, a good example is uh, Spec Ops: The Line. You know, there, 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 there was a, a really good linear anti-war story, and then you have multiplayer tacked on, in my opinion, of where you're just mercilessly shooting enemies. Doesn't fit into what that game was was about. It, it, it felt like a te like they the, like you said they felt like they had to add value to to that game. And it, it it should just been a standalone single player game, and for, in, in my opinion, that actually ended up taking away from it. Same criticism of Tomb Raider. Awesome campaign, yes. multiplayer didn't need to be there, and almost detracts from yeah. the experience of its very existence. And, and I know people might say, "Oh, Mike, you're just just don't play it if you don't like it." 
let's go back to Spec Ops for a sec. I said this in an old review I did on my old podcast that I took a point off because the multiplayer actually, like by just going straight up team deathmatch and just killing people, actually yep. takes away from the whole lesson to be learned from the campaign. And I thought that actually exactly. it takes away from the experience. I'm like, oh my God, I just, it just totally, it's become a hypocrite now. So I think Spec Ops The Line also would have played and looked better if it had just yeah, ditched yeah. that multiplayer it didn't need and the co-op. And just had a, yeah, yeah. like a, like a, spent more time fine tuning the mechanics. Yeah, you know, and thankfully some developers have kind of stuck to the, to their guns. Like, could you imagine Ken Levine, if, big if, example? Yeah. Oh, there was or, that was a like, big you, controversy. Bioshock Infinite, man. No, my multiplayer. Yeah, that 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 would have it, it it didn't fit. And thankfully, you know, he's a smart enough guy that he decided not to go that way because that again would have harmed the package that. It, is the awesomest that was Bioshock Infinite. Well, right? and that's, and think about the Bioshock series, man. I know, like, we're almost venturing off topic, but we're gonna steer back in a second. I'm gonna bridge this, you watch, you watch. But um, the, the the problem, remind me what we were saying there again, what game were we talking about? We were talking about- uh, Bioshock Infinite. Bioshock Infinite, so look at the Bioshock series as a whole, all right? Most people, when they talk about the greatness of Bioshock, they they, they tend, tend to disclu they tend to exclude Bioshock Two. Now, I'm not I don't have too much of an opinion because I have only played number three, unfortunately. I'm trying to play my way through the series and get the full perspective. But what I often hear is that two is kind of meh, and surprisingly, that was the only one that held multiplayer. So Ken Levine was yes. very firm in saying this is a complete experience. We will release instead of multiplayer episodic content which everybody was cool with. And yep. kind of steering to Last of Us, we were just talking about this before we recorded, Joe. I think The Last of Us is one of those rare examples that got both sides right. Yeah. Let's talk about that for a second. Like, it, like okay, That's added a, value, maybe didn't need a multiplayer. Well, how was the multiplayer? Yeah, it, it was good, but stressing again, fit into the context of the story because you weren't just having te team deathmatch and just killing people for the sake of killing. You're, you're killing, to, you're, you're, you're defending yourself so you can survive, you know, it, and fits into the context of the story of Last of Us. It's, it wasn't just attacked on, shoot them up, team deathmatch shooter. It's not two separate pieces. It's one whole package that you need to play as a exactly. whole. And, and, they, they and, were de they were developed at the same time alongside of each other, which is the key. Which is what some of these games uh, actually do is that they actually the, the the single player game is developed by one team, and then some other little side develop developer develops the multiplayer and tacks it on to the main game, and you, you, you it, it it shows. Right, but at the same time, it was a risky proposition. That could have flopped oh, yeah. huge, right? And that's why yep. it almost would have seemed safer, and I think better in the long run, if they'd gone the Ken Levine route and just focused mm -hmm. more on episodic content. Inst instead of running the risk of making a crappy, like, watered-down sequel, why not just put out three hours worth of episodic content, tying together a few of those open-ended knots of the story? That would have been awesome. And, I, and again, I love Last of Us. I'm not saying that I would change it. I'm just saying in an alternate yeah. universe, I think that could have been a great idea. And I don't think everybody should try to emulate Last of Us because Naughty Dog obviously has a ton of resources to make that multiplayer work properly. And yep. come on, man, you've seen... Dude, you've seen so many, like, little Thomas the engines that could, you know, like, let's let's talk about, you know, for a second, Ride to Hell. They tried to oh make this God. giant sandbox Western game and fell flat on their face. They just ran out of time. They had this huge world with nothing to do because it was just, they ran out of time. They, 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 yeah. they, they, they suffocated under this huge, like thing they wanted to do when they could have just been more focused, used their resources better and made yeah. a tighter game. And that's and tying it that. back to sandboxes. It's again, this idea of making it bigger, but having nothing to do. And it just takes away from the main experience. And you saw that with that ride to hell, you know, be, that, that story is one of the, one of the, the biggest travesties of the last little while. And, and, Supposedly, you know, you know, and I think you've told me that you said that this probably isn't going to happen, but that that's slated to be a, a three-part series. I dare a developer to, to try to pull that shit off. If that if that happens, that'll be one of the biggest travesties uh, of this generation. God, indie developers. I mean, 
think about your resources, think about like the size of your team and what you're actually realistically capable of doing. You are not yep. out, out your first outing gonna make the next Mass Effect. You're not gonna make the next Halo, but you may make the next Device 6. You may make the next pixel junk shooter. You get noticed. You do your small thing and then you do the bigger thing later. Look how Naughty yeah. Dog started out, man, and obviously they're AAA, but they just, you know, started out doing little things, you know, like, that's, that's, that's the right you have to go. You, you can't, it's it's like, your eyes can't be bigger than your stomach in, in terms of creativity. You gotta, you gotta work with the resources you have, and you ultimately get a better product, and, you, and I think that developers can't be a slave to all these trolls on the internet who are asking for unrealistic things because that's what they happen to like. It's like me going online saying, all games have to be story-driven, no exploration. That's wrong, there are games that are awesome to just hang out in, you know? Like, but yeah. that's not really my thing. I like it sometimes, some people like it more than me. Like, yeah. there's people who would argue the teeth that Fallout 3 is one of the greatest games ever made. I personally thought it was boring because I need things to happen. That's just my opinion, but it's not standard. No. And, and I think it, that, it, like, it, what you're saying, Joe, is that we have these defined sub-genres of the sandbox. If we look at the top, I'd almost say, like, Minecraft is, like, the core sandbox. Then you have yeah. Grand Theft Auto, which is the peak of it. And then you have everything mm -hmm. else into different sub-genres. And I think with Watch Dogs, it found its wrong sub-genre. Yeah, it's absolutely right. And a good example of, like you were saying, maybe trying to sort of, I guess, buy off more than you can shoot. Right, and we, and this possibly a reason maybe why that was delayed as well, right? And you know, you you, you gotta think some of those guys in that team were maybe kind of questioning what was going on there. I just think that they blew an opportunity to do something really great, Joe. I think in the whole climate of Edward Snowden and Julian Assange, yeah. WikiLeaks, what's going on with the the American government spying on the globe. Watch Dogs had a chance to make an impact, and Ubisoft is no stranger to politics, man. Like, look at Far Cry yeah. 3, look at Far Cry 4, look at Valiant Hearts. You know, they're not, they're no stranger to, you know, ruffling, not ruffling a few feathers, but going into some uncharted political territory. I think they had a really good chance to make a commentary, and to me, Joe, from watching it, it seems more just like a glorification of what, hack, what they dreamed hackers might actually be like, and I don't think this represents anybody. No, because and, and even as you, as you're playing as that character, you're, you're uh, for me and it was uh, for yeah like for me like I'm trying to see trying to think to myself okay what's my motivation playing this character you know I, I play a lot of these games kind of with that role playing game kind of mentality like what what's I like, I like to get immersed in the character and really think about what's the actual motivation and with, with that character in particular I just I can't. Uh, you just don't get that feeling, right? Well, and that's why I hate yeah. on Infamous. Not because it's sandbox. Like, it, that yeah. game needs to be sandbox. It's a superhero game. You need to be able to travel yeah. around great distances. My problem with Infamous is that it's a lame duck, archetypal, no personality yep. character. Really, it's just it's just one of these arc these cool archetypes that they think are going to appeal to like millennials and teens and mm -hmm. oh, it's like the cool like you know cool Hollywood action hero. And I mean, we're just inundated with those kind of like two dimensional kind of heroes. We need some some real people with with real like vulnerabilities. Like like even like Trevor, you know, in GTA Five, man. Some people might argue at first glance that he's just a two-dimensional sociopath, but dude, as you play through that game, dude, he, 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 there's a tenderness to him, a twisted yeah. tenderness. There's like this, some weird psychotic camaraderie. Like Which there's there's levels, here, man, it. and it, yeah. that's what just makes it such a, an experience that I, I have no problem coming back to. I never feel bored playing yeah. GTA V. I feel like I'm in heaven, Joe. Like, and I I know that yeah. sounds kind of uh, airy fairy, but truly, like that's a Zen game for me because it's so perfectly designed. I can just put it on for three hours, enjoy a couple of days in Los Santos, and yeah. everything feels meaningful. I didn't waste any time because I designed that whole experience myself, and I was busy doing different things that not only were fun in themselves, but push the greater narrative forward. Because you know that you're leveling yourself up, you're you're, you're finding out more about the character, and that's going to make the next mission mean that much more. Yep, and, and I, I was hoping to get that out of Watch Dogs, you know, because, you know, for me, like, I wanted to kind of live out my nerdy kind of ambition to be a hacker. Yeah, and thanks a lot, I Glenn just, Beck, uh, unfortunately. Okay, yeah, let's, let's clear that, that up quickly. Glenn Beck thinks that Watch Dogs can teach your kids how to hack. Does it, Joe? 
for, for uh, because this is an audio podcast, uh, yeah, uh, I'm holding up my Dual Shock Four. Are you are you now living <laughs> yeah. the dream of being a hacker, Joy? You... Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna start walking around the streets with my with my controller going. Okay, I'm gonna hack this guy's bank account. <laughs> so uh, he's wrong. He's wrong there. That that, that game, you know, it, and it, that's great. Getting into a greater topic, that that uh, video games were only influenced people, and that's. A crock but of we shit might as well mention that Glenn Beck's a fucking tool, and and he's a, he's yeah. a tool establishment. He he's out there to to basically sway you right wingers, so don't be fooled. Anyway, <laughs> that's enough about yeah. that. Um, that was yeah. a pretty awesome kind of. Uh, overview of where where it's come from in terms of open world versus linear i think joe that we've kind of debunked the myth that linear games are going away i mean e3 showed so much promise in terms of like like an uncharted 4 i mean yeah zelda may be going open world but it's, it's really just open world light zelda you know is gonna have a great story i hope at least i hope oh, yeah. that going open world won't ruin zelda remains to be yeah. seen but there's still a lot, and especially from the indie realm, Joe. I mean, if even if maybe all AAAs one day decide to go sandbox, we're still gonna get Gone Home. We're still gonna get, you know, uh, like we said, Valiant Hearts or Child of Light or Transistor, man. Like, come on, like, yeah. there are great stories to be told. Is... They're not going anywhere, people. Beyond Two Souls was yeah. way better than you gave it credit for. Metal Gear Solid haters, honestly, video games can be like movies. There's room for it, so stop hating on Metal Gear. For its cutscenes, I'm I'm getting soapboxy now, but just kind of a few things I wanted to hopefully maybe clear up. Anything else to say yeah, about this, yeah. Joe? Well, you know where, where where it's going. You know the, the these genres are all getting hopefully coexist together. You know and there's definitely room for for all three of those uh, different ways of approaching a game. And uh, you know it, it's uh, like we said just. Uh, when it comes to developing these games, look at the actual experience that you're trying to craft, and then make that decision of to, whether to go linear or to go sandbox or to go somewhere in the in the middle. But but based on the actual experience that you're trying to create there, make it relevant. And, uh, make and, all the parts work. Exactly. It's like making a movie, like a great movie. You know that it's edited well, the sound works, the performances work, everything just works properly. Same with the video game. Every component. Every feature has to be has to be tuned to, to work properly. I mean, XCOM, wow, what a yeah. great example of, of something that takes that to an extreme level. But anyway, also developers, just stop chasing trends. Watch Dogs could have been a brilliant, like semi on rails narrative set in just a part of Chicago and really told a story and really could have been done at 60 frames and 1080p if it just been scaled yeah. back a bit. Just, 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 Stop following trends. Stop trying to be the next thing. Especially all the people who are copying, all the poor developers who are trying to copy, copy Demon Souls. I think Bound by Flame was kind of like the first kind of casualty yeah, yeah. Out, of, out of this. Um, it, it's, inev it's inevitably going to happen, Joe, but I hope at least you developers thinking that you can reinvent the wheel and just kind of reskin something and call it your own. Well, the audience isn't stupid, people, and, and they do vote with their dollars. So just instead of trying to follow trends, make your own. That's how Shigeru Miyamoto built the house of Nintendo and, and that's how you can make your next great idea. Just just think outside the goddamn box. Yeah. Just be just be, be creative and, and uh, you know do do what uh, what your heart and your mind tells you to do a thing. Don't don't be a slave to trends. If something's popular, do the opposite. Mm -hmm. How about that? There you go. So that's round table 11 guys. That's a, that was a nice good debate. Stay tuned. We always got more uh, more content coming we recently launched a new show joe maybe you want to tell people about that new show we just put up i revised this where we uh suggest uh things that uh, we think need to be uh changed or altered or revised and we did the uh, the uh, dual shock for the controller for the ps4 and what we feel uh is right and what we feel is wrong and what could be tweaked and changed about that and uh not just on hardware, but uh, on games. You know, anything that we feel needs to be maybe, you know, to be tweaked or to be changed a little bit. Absolutely, guys. And as you know, E3 just finished up last week. You know, thank you to all of you who tuned in for the uh, watch-alongs on 24 Bay Heroes. Uh, of course, we got lots to say about it. We we're just kind of really still trying to mull over everything we, we learned, but expect <laughs> some... Uh, not yeah. We're not really just going to kind of go over a laundry list of what you already saw during the conference. We're really going to try to break it down and, and take a look at where the next 12 to 18 months realistically are going in the industry. 
because honestly, like just kind of a pre prelude to our next podcast, Joe, we, we, yeah. we definitely see a lot of the similar opinions about how E3 went this year. And for some reason, Joe and I are kind of like in this minority. We don't really agree with a lot of the opinions out there. So we're going to kind of get into what we thought happened at E3, but also shed light like I did last year. What we're going to do is really shed light on the next breaking news on a lot of the indie titles that were kind of shouted out during a conference, but kind of glossed over. So stay tuned. We always have great stuff. It's going to be a bright 2014 and 15, guys. So get excited. Whatever platform yeah. you're on, Nintendo Wii U, Xbox One, PC, Mac, PS4. Oh my God, there's just so much good. There's that's so the one. Good. Th that's the one thing I think we can agree on, Joe, is that the gamers won E3. It did. I, I don't say any of the like. I may think Sony did. That's my opinion. But in the general scape, everybody revealed something good. So we got a lot to look forward to. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and at the end of the day, you know, it, it really does come down to to the games. Exactly, that's what we're in this for. So uh, this has been Roundtable 11, Open World versus Linear Games. You're listening to the Joystick Justice League. Thank you for uh, tuning in as always. I'm Mike Frisios. I'm Joe Morin. Peace out, guys. We will talk to you soon. Game on. Game on, guys.